Jerry Adams are the two most hated words in Britain, said a tabloid newspaper. But tonight Panorama reveals how the man we hate to love has become the best hope for peace since Ireland was divided. Jerry Adams is a writer. He's been allowed back to Britain to sell his books since he persuaded the IRA to put away their guns. Some literary critics say he's a natural storyteller. One story he's never told is about his life in the IRA. How are you doing? The British authorities believe Jerry Adams has been the IRA's foremost strategist for many years. Where are you? You wouldn't know it to meet him. What, what name of the business? Uh, Rosemary and Charles. He comes across as courteous, even gentle. But Jerry Adams' biggest story is how and why he managed to persuade the IRA to cease violence after 25 years. How far has Jerry Adams travelled in 25 years? Well, oh, long distance. I mean, if, if one goes back, I remember the, the troubles in 69 and 70. I mean, a long, long distance. I must salute uh, the way in which Jerry Adams has successfully made the transformation from hard terrorist to astute politician. In my view, he was uh, a brave man, and I hope he will be justified. Although the IRA ceasefire has now held for five months, Jerry Adams has yet to explain what led the IRA to call it. The mystery is why the IRA stopped so far short of their goal, a united Ireland. Adams has declined to discuss this with Panorama or anyone else. All he said is that a jigsaw fell into place. Jerry Adams was born into a staunchly Republican Belfast family. His father was shot and wounded by the IUC and imprisoned in the 1940s. His uncle Liam was an IRA quartermaster. Both sides of his family had been involved with previous IRA campaigns to drive the British out of Ireland since they divided it in 1920. Adams has always regarded Britain as the root of all evil in his country. They had ignored the protests by Catholic nationalists that Protestant Unionists were rigging everything from elections to jobs. To Adams, the brutal suppression of the nationalist civil rights movement was confirmation of a police state that was unreformable. But what had started as a battle with Unionists soon became a battle with the British Army. It caused the Republican movement to split into two factions. Those who saw no future in violence because it had failed in the past and those who thought they would fight the IRA campaign to end all campaigns. They called themselves the Provisionals. Adams has always denied he joined them, but one founder member has a clear recollection of the man who very quickly became the officer commanding of an IRA company in Belfast. In those early days, is it right that he was O.C. of Bally Murphy? He was, yeah. That's on record, that he was O.C. of Bally Murphy, yes. What would his attitude to military operations have been? I think his attitude to those two military operations would have been that every military operation has to have a political objective. I think that would have been basically Jerry's attitude to it. I think that that is basically a guerrilla attitude to it as well. Like, you know, there's no point in having military operations just for the sake of a military operation. The intelligence services believe Adams soon graduated from company commander to running the IRA's 2nd Battalion for 10 months. 
In that time, it killed 52 policemen, soldiers and civilians. In 1972, Adams was interned without trial in Long Kesh, now known as the Mays Prison. That July came evidence of his growing status within the IRA. William Whitelaw, the Northern Ireland Secretary, had agreed to secret peace talks, provided the IRA called a truce. They agreed, provided Adams was allowed to go free. Adams was only 23, but he helped make the arrangements for the talks. He met a senior civil servant from London who had been posted to Belfast. I'd been briefed that although Adams was a young man, he was a senior member of the Belfast Battalion, and that battalion had been uh, murdering and shooting and bombing, and therefore I expected, putting it frankly, an aggressive, streetwise young tough. And I was therefore pleasantly surprised when instead a very personable, likable, intelligent, articulate and persuasive young man appeared. At one point, I said to him, um, you're a young man, you've got your life ahead of you. Do you really want to spend it on the run from um, us British? Uh, to which he replied, no, he didn't. And I said, well, what would you like to do? He said, I'd like to go to university and get a degree. So I said, well, we're not stopping you. All you've got to do is to renounce violence and you can go to university. To which he said, well, uh, I've got to help to get you British out of Northern Ireland first. The IRA delegation and the British rendezvoused in the countryside from where they were flown to England. They met William Whitelaw at a house in Chelsea. The meeting lasted less than an hour. The IRA demanded the British leave within two years and they wanted a decision from the Cabinet at their next meeting. I was concerned at the meeting that we'd had uh, uh, with the Secretary of State and their cloud cuckoo land performance. So I deliberately went into their compartment of the aeroplane and deliberately said to them, I hope you're not going to start your bloody stupid campaign of violence again, and explained that if they really wanted a united Ireland, they were wasting their time shooting British soldiers and bombing Northern Ireland into a, an industrial and social slum. If they really wanted a united Ireland, they should persuade the Protestants that they could have a good life in the South. Soon after the White Law talks, the IRA set off 26 bombs in Belfast. 11 were killed, 130 injured. July the 21st, 1972, was known as Bloody Friday. More than two years passed before the IRA called a second truce in February 1975. BBC News at nine o'clock. Within the past few minutes, reports have been coming in that the provisional IRA has announced a new open-ended ceasefire with a factor of six... The IRA hoped for concessions, but the British used the LAL to undermine the organisation by penetrating it with agents. It was a near disaster for the IRA. Adams had been recaptured and was back in Longkesh prison. He feared the IRA might be beaten. Their all-out offensive had failed to move the British. Adams realised a long war would be needed. From inside prison, he set out to rebuild the IRA and to equip them with a new long-term strategy. During his three years in the Mays prison in the mid-70s, uh, Jerry Adams drew up a, a blueprint for a restructured IRA uh, based on the classic communist uh, cellular terrorist movement. Uh, the clumsy army organization of battalions and companies was scrapped uh, and in its place uh, were introduced uh, four-man cells, ASUs, active service units. Uh, these gave uh, improved security. Uh, they were independent, separated by cutoffs, and far harder to penetrate uh, by our own uh, informants. Yet Adams was never an out-and-out -out militarist, as we know from his most private thoughts. 
He set these out in a regular column for the IRA's newspaper, which he wrote from prison. Disguising his identity with a pseudonym, Adams said that violence would cease to be justified when it failed to advance the nationalist cause. I am an IRA volunteer. The course I take involves the use of physical force, but only if I achieve the situation where my people genuinely prosper can my action be seen by me to have been justified. Adams knew he could not sustain his long war strategy by military means alone. The IRA would need an active political wing to campaign for greater support from the nationalist community. The IRA depended on them for shelter, transport, and hiding guns. You can talk to um, Republican prisoners who were in the, in the cages in, in the mid-1970s when Adams was there, and they'll say that one of the things that Adams said was that you know, this is a political struggle. You know, it is not enough just to you know, develop militarily. We have to develop a political machine that is able to capitalize on any military gains we make. Soon after he was released from jail in 1977, Adams set out his strategy to popularize the Republican movement to an audience of the IRA's political wing, Sinn Féin. So I think it must be a basic tactic, a basic principle of republicanism that we fight on behalf of the people. We fight because the people want us to fight. Until then, Sinn Féin had been largely a protest movement. Now Adams wanted to turn it into a political party, embracing issues that mattered to ordinary nationalists. Adams believed the IRA leadership had no strategy for sustaining the long war. A power struggle against the old guard was now underway. Both states must be dismantled and replaced by an entirely new Ireland. I know that uh, from he came out of prison in, at the beginning of 1977, uh, that he started to um, place his own people in charge in different aspects of the movement. They seemed to shadow uh, every uh, official in Sinn Féin, that each person was marked by an alternative person. There's been a spate of fire bombings in Belfast. Targets chosen by terrorists included warehouses and... A new Northern Command run by the Adams faction had taken control of military strategy from the South. His political direction guiding the military targeting was now evident. IRA statements spoke of destabilizing the economy because it served the interests of the British, not the people. Certainly he played a key role in the new Northern Command uh, particularly in uh, forging closer links between the IRA and the Sinn Féin. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, our intelligence was telling us uh, that he had also become uh, re-involved uh, militarily. And the reports indicated uh, that no substantial terrorist operation in Belfast uh, could be mounted uh, without Adams's personal sanction. Adams was soon predicting military defeat for the British. It is inevitable and obvious, he said. A border ambush in August 1979 gave the IRA a glimpse of victory. The 18 soldiers blown to bits at Warren Point was the British Army's biggest single loss since the Second World War. Warren Point was the high point of the IRA's military campaign. But with more advanced warnings from better intelligence on the British side, the military campaign soon became a standoff. And perhaps it was the recognition of this that explains why Adams had been so keen to advance the political arm of his joint strategy, to increase support amongst ordinary nationalists for republicanism and the IRA. The opportunity to do this came almost out of the blue in 1981 from the Iron Maiden herself. The IRA saw themselves as prisoners of war. Mrs. Thatcher branded them common criminals. This touched a raw nerve even amongst nationalists who disagreed with the IRA's methods, if not their cause. 
The prisoners campaigned for political status and began a hunger strike. Sands Bobby, political prisoner, 30,000. Yeah! Bobby Sands, a convicted IRA gunman, was elected to the British Parliament while starving himself to death. His victory was beyond Adam's wildest dreams. Stop him. One hundred thousand people attended Sands' funeral. The IRA now thought they could take power in Ireland with a strategy known as the Armalite and Ballot Box, welding together its military and political wings. Buoyed by this new tidal wave of nationalist feeling, Adams decided Sinn Féin should contest every single election in the North. I think that the hunger strike gave the leadership of the Republican movement, which certainly included Adams in a major way at the time, a greater sense of confidence that they could control and perhaps even dictate events, particularly on the nationalist side of politics, including in the South, than any previous event since perhaps partition. Sinn Féin's electoral bandwagon looked unstoppable with Adams's election as MP for West Belfast in 1983. He beat the moderate SDLP candidate. The IRA's political wing now threatened to eclipse constitutional nationalism in the North. Politically, Jerry Adams was riding high. That same year, he completed his takeover of the Republican movement's leadership. He was elected president of Sinn Féin. I am glad of the opportunity to pay tribute to the freedom fighters, to the men and women volunteers of the IRA. The fear that Sinn Féin's electoral tide might destabilise the whole of Ireland led the Irish and British governments to sign the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1985. The treaty was designed to undermine the IRA by encouraging nationalists to reject Sinn Féin and to pursue their aspiration for a united Ireland constitutionally through the ballot box with the SDLP. The treaty allowed Dublin to be consulted about the way the North was governed. More important was Article 1. It said that although Britain would guarantee the status of Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom, it would do this only so long as a majority wanted it. Then, Britain would facilitate Irish unity. In public, Gerry Adams denounced the treaty. He said it was a sellout by constitutional nationalists and the Irish government. It copper fastened the border and would only prolong the conflict. It now appears that in private, Gerry Adams came to precisely the opposite view. Michael Lillis was the Irish civil servant who drafted the treaty. He was head of the Anglo-Irish section at the Department of Foreign Affairs. Since then, he's had several lengthy private conversations with Gerry Adams. It was quite clear that uh, privately, uh, he and his colleagues saw it as a very significant event and one which was uh, much more positive and significant than the way they reacted to it in public. I think that one of the reasons they reacted to it negatively in public was that it was presented wrongly, including by my own side, as being a, uh, an attempt to take the ground away from the IRA and its supporters. What effect do you actually think it had on him in, in the quest for alternatives? Well, I think it, it certainly violence. fed a process of reflection, which was uh, beginning to uh, take seriously the um, proposition that the British did not have a fundamental and immovable desire to, as it were, hang on to Northern Ireland. If Lillis is right, 1985 marks the crucial turning point in Adams's attitude to violence. On the Catholic side of the wall dividing the two communities in Belfast is the Clonard Monastery. The Clonard is a very important part of the peace jigsaw. Despite his public denunciations of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, 
Jerry Adams decided to explore in secret the opportunities it might offer for a peaceful alternative to the IRA campaign. In 1986, he enlisted the help of a Clonard priest who'd been a confidant for many years. The priest was Father Alec Reed. He shared Adams's dream of uniting Ireland, though not his methods. From 1986, he made regular trips to Dublin carrying messages from Jerry Adams. Father Reed had opened a direct channel to the Irish Prime Minister, Charles Haughey. For the first time, Adams glimpsed the possibility of a ceasefire. In public, he was saying that to call one, short of a British withdrawal, would amount to surrender. Now in private, he was telling Haughey he would consider recommending a ceasefire to the IRA if the Irish government agreed to pursue reunification. Father Reid had regular meetings at Charles Haughey's country mansion near Dublin. This secret dialogue continued with the man who replaced Hahi, Albert Reynolds. Here lie the origins of the process that culminated eight years later in the IRA ceasefire. Father Reid became a very important cog in that wheel, in that um, he, he had an insight into their thinking. He was very close to them. He knew uh, what they were saying and, uh, and he could, he could uh, reflect that when he came to see you, you know. And, and I mean, he, the man worked tirelessly at it uh, for the last couple of years with me. And I know that he's been trying and trying for quite a number of years to try and, uh, and move the whole Republicans away from violence. While Adams was privately contemplating alternatives to violence, in public, he was meeting John Hume, the SDLP leader. In their conversations, Hume argued that the Anglo-Irish Treaty made it clear Britain's only reason for staying in Ireland were the rights of the one million Protestants. The challenge, said Hume, was to persuade them to join the Republic peacefully. The low, the IRA would see themselves as attacking the British. In effect, my argument, and it's all in a lot of speeches, was that the actual people being attacked were the Unionist people of the north of Ireland. And that all that that was doing was deepening the divisions on this island, which was the real problem. Throughout my dialogue with Gerry Adams, I kept the, both governments fully informed. And on one occasion did say to them, look, the, the issue at the center of all this is British interests. And if you make clear that Britain doesn't any longer have any selfish interests in Northern Ireland, that will be a major contribution to the peace process. The then Northern Ireland Secretary Peter Brook obliged with a speech in November 1990. Brook offers road to peace, the papers said. His speech has proved to be a milestone. The British government, Brooke reassured Republicans, has no selfish, strategic or economic interest in Northern Ireland. What I had become conscious of, of being a regular reader of the Republican newspaper during the ensuing year, uh, was that there were frequent references to colonial regime. And of course, they may have been there because that was the a rhetoric which was suitable to the Republican cause. But it did occur to me also that it might be based on a, on a misreading of history. Uh, there had clearly been uh, economic reasons for colonial activity on the part of the British over the previous 300 years. There had clearly been strategic reasons for British policy towards Ireland at various stages during the previous 800 years. But neither the economic argument nor the strategic argument was the reason why we were there now. And I needed to make sure that it was understood that the reason we were there now was basically to protect the validity of the ballot box. Within a month, by Christmas 1990, the Brook speech had produced a clear dividend. In the past few minutes, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Brook, has welcomed the ceasefire as possibly being a pointer to achieving a lasting solution in 1991. But the IRA also had another motive for this goodwill gesture. Their military campaign had started to become counterproductive. In 1988, they'd launched an offensive which they called the final phase, in which they killed more soldiers and policemen. But in a series of catastrophic blunders, they also killed more civilians. It was costing them support. 
Sinn Féin's share of the nationalist vote had settled at around just 10%. In public, Adams denied the future of armed struggle was being debated inside the Republican movement. In private, that's exactly what was happening. The realization was that no one was going to win this war. The realization was that this was going to continue and continue and continue, and that there was going to be no victor. So I think that Jerry, given the mind that he had, was pushed more and more towards finding, as many people would have been in the Republican movement, towards finding a political solution. May Almighty God bless you. The Clonard Monastery, who'd fixed a secret channel for Adams to the Irish government, now set up another one at his request to Unionists. Adams had always said Unionists would come round to the idea of a united Ireland after the British had gone. Now in private, he appeared to recognize the need for the consent of the people who'd every reason to fear him and everything he stood for. The Reverend Ken Newell and a church elder, Dennis Boyd, were among Protestants who met Adams at a series of regular meetings from 1991. I expected to meet someone who was so convinced of the rightness of his own position and of the need for violence to change the structures in the North that he would have very little sympathy with the tradition, the Unionist and the Protestant tradition from which I came, and who would really be rather fixed in his mind so that there'd be very little movement. And did you find someone with a closed mind? Uh, the answer to that would be no. His mind was much more open. Did you end up liking him? Well, as much as he liked me, I hope. I, d I don't know whether he liked you or not. Did you? But did you like him? Uh, I can't say that I didn't like him. Oh, I can't say that I didn't like him. I, I, I was quite convinced after a year into the dialogue that he had uh, become convinced of the need for a democratic resolution of the conflict and the need, therefore, f to call a ceasefire or to persuade uh, the IRA of the and the need of a ceasefire. Um, he and several other Sinn Féin leaders became convinced of that, uh, but they had an uphill battle because at first I felt that they were um, going to have a terribly difficult job. And so did Adams. In 1993, it still appeared to be business as usual. Two bombs in the city of London had cost more financially than all the bombs in Northern Ireland over 20 years. The IRA warned Britain, you haven't seen the half of it, and it looked as if they meant it. But in private, Adams was trying to plant the thought in the IRA's mind that Britain's heart was no longer in stain. Do you think that Gerry Adams thinks, the British, whatever they may say in public, that their heart is not in staying in Northern Ireland? Well, I certainly argued that strongly to him, and he listened. And from the questions that he asked me, I want to be fair to him. I, it would be inaccurate of me to say that that is his conviction. But from the questions that he, he put repeatedly on several occasions, I believe that, you know, he is convinced that that's the case. Well, the British would like to go. They would they like could. to go. Yeah. But could. I think that he has learned something, even though he probably doesn't go as far as I think he should, about the fact that the British cannot exercise that preference because it would be wrong to do so. Adams's peace initiative was nearly blown to pieces in October 1993. An IRA bomb exploded in the heart of Protestant Belfast. The IRA's target had been loyalist paramilitaries. Instead, they killed nine ordinary Protestants in a Shankill Road fish shop. The bridges that Jerry Adams had been building to Protestants threatened to collapse. He tried to limit the damage. What happened in the Shankill Road was wrong. The people of the Shankill are my people. This is my city. The Shankill Road's only 100 yards from here. Uh, the people who were killed, well, they're Thomas Bagley, or those who he killed are my people. It was wrong that it happened. It was inexcusable that it happened. I don't want to see it happening again.
Adams's regret and anger looked genuine, and it was, but the Protestants didn't buy it. Thomas Begley, the 19-year-old IRA bomber, had blown himself up. At his funeral, Adams carried his coffin, knowing this would cause widespread offence, but his priority was to move the IRA forward with him. To have distanced himself could have destroyed the peace process. By December 1993, London had been persuaded by Dublin to sign a joint declaration. It contained much of what Adams had discussed with John Hume. The British recognised a key IRA demand, the right of the Irish people in both parts of Ireland to decide their future. But the outcome could be vetoed by a majority in the north. That meant the borders stayed for the foreseeable future. All the two Prime Ministers were offering Sinn Féin was talks, and then only if the IRA called a ceasefire. The IRA regarded acceptance of the declaration as surrender. Privately, Adams knew it was all they were getting. For 25 years, they'd fought and died to drive out the British. Now they were being asked to lay down their arms merely for a seat at the peace conference table. Last August, the IRA leadership decided it was going for only a short break in violence. Albert Reynolds sent Adams a private message. I wasn't interested in three months or six months. I mean, I know it's a terrible thing to say that, you know, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't welcome uh, stopping violence for three months or six months. But sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. And, uh, you know, I said, look, we've, we've invested all the, the, the initiative and the effort in this. Uh, and it's either, it's either indefinite ceasefire or nothing. It's no political interest. For Adams, promoting a ceasefire so far short of the IRA's goal of a united Ireland was going to be a monumental gamble. He'd always promised loyal supporters of the Republican movement that he'd never split it. Shortly before the ceasefire, Adams told a friend, some frightening decisions will have to be taken soon. A few days later, the IRA sent a short written message to the Irish government. A ceasefire had been agreed. At that stage, I felt, yes, uh, yeah, this is, this is it, I think. Uh, well, all was something can go wrong at the last moment, but I felt, barring some, some, uh, something unforeseen, that, uh, yes, we were, we were close to the right decision. And when you relayed that to John Major some days before the announcement, what was his reaction? Did he believe you? No, not initially, no. He, he was extremely surprised. He didn't believe me. He, he says, I hope, I sincerely hope you're, you're, you're right in your view. Uh, but, uh, you know, nobody around here believes that's, uh, that's going to happen. And, uh, you know, it took quite some time after for them to really believe that it was going to be uh, for good. Uh, it's only in recent times that they've come round the full circle. But you knew you had a deal. Well, I knew I had a deal, yeah, I did, yeah. On the 31st of August 1994, the IRA announced the ceasefire. Adams did not claim victory. How could he? All he said was that the sacrifice had been worth it. If we had not decided 25 years ago that we were never again going to be treated like second-class second citizens, we would still have been treated like second-class, subhuman, undignified human beings. I knew I had a deal and I knew the deal was going to stick. Uh, and that's why within within the first week, um, I had Jerry Adams into the political process, standing in government buildings here in Dublin. Uh, because I said I would. I said, uh, if the right decision is taken, uh, you'll be into the process within one week. And so he was. Once, this scene would have been unthinkable. Jerry Adams, the violent revolutionary, stepping out with Ireland's constitutional head of state. Now, it was vital for his credibility with the IRA. An hour earlier, they'd met privately over a cup of tea. We talked about uh, the Republican history as to where it has come. And I mean, I, I congratulated him on the courage and the visions he had for taking the Republican movement uh, 
to where he had taken it on that particular and very historic day. Uh, and that history would be very kind to him in that regard. Uh, and uh, he, he appeared nervous, uh, you know. Did he? Yeah, he did, yeah. he, he was, uh, it was. It was a very historic day for him. Uh, and then we went down and we stood on the steps for the famous handshake and said to the world, you know, this is it. The nationalists have come together uh, or to follow the, 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 the course of peace for the future. Having marched the IRA to the top of the hill in the early 1980s, Jerry Adams has now marched them down again, and that is perhaps his greatest achievement. Two key allies have helped him. Both are now leading the negotiations with the British. Both personify everything that is hard about the IRA. One is Martin McGuinness, a former IRA chief of staff. The other is Jerry Kelly, a former bomber and jailbreaker, and now believed to be their adjutant general. But it is Jerry Adams who led the IRA to take that first critical step to stop shooting so that they can start talking and be listened to. That step was a critical step. Uh, I've described it myself as, as a Rubicon. Uh, he led them across that Rubicon. It was like many acts of leadership. I, in my view, that was a courageous step. He had a leadership role to perform. He performed it. And I think the whole of Ireland and the whole of uh, the, these islands, and I think arguably the whole of the world, is grateful to him for having done it. Uh, it is a fairly remarkable thing for a former British Northern Ireland secretary to uh, pay tribute to an IRA man's courage. Well, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, it, 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 uh, Irish history is uh, littered with occasions when people have in fact been attacked from behind. Uh, therefore, understandably, anybody who does take so forward a step uh, is, in my view, taking a courageous, step, a courageous one. Courageous is not a word the British government have yet used to describe Gerry Adams. Abroad, he's fated as a statesman. The British have done all they can to stop that. I think with a, a few bumps on the road so far, but we've, we've managed to move it ahead. And... They even tried to stop Adams from selling the ceasefire to politicians here in America, where the IRA have many supporters. John Major didn't believe Adams could deliver, but he did. The Northern Ireland Secretary, Sir Patrick Mayhew, says he still doesn't trust him. Yet the fact is, without Gerry Adams, there'd be no prospect of moving towards a peaceful island. I suspect that the IRA hardliners will only stay with Jerry Adams so long as they reckon uh, that uh, he can deliver results. Now, if he forfeits their confidence uh, and remember that in so many ways he is trying to achieve the unachievable, uh, then cracks will open up. Uh, new splinter groups uh, will spring up and then the fear, I think, must be that once again, the IRA will go through uh, yet another metamorphosis and yet another organization structure under a new leadership will emerge, uh, probably dedicated to prolonging the long war. Who, in your judgment, is best able to prevent those cracks from appearing, to ensure that Jerry Adams is delivering results? Uh, ironically, I think it must be us, the British. On New Year's Eve, Belfast's two divided communities took their first tentative steps towards each other. They pray the new year will be the start of a new era. Britain has said it no longer has a long-term vested interest in Northern Ireland. But it does still have a short-term one. The government relies on the votes of unionist MPs to stay in power. The key to sustaining peace is whether the government dares risk unionist wrath by helping Gerry Adams. But if his sworn enemies want to hold on to the peace that's become so cherished, they may have to reconcile themselves to embracing the president of Sinn Féin.